Okay, so uh, we're going to be talking about for the next three, um, well, I guess the next two, tonight and two more, um, about finding relief and, and kind of the areas that we go to in life to try and find relief and maybe a better alternative of where we can find relief. And we're going to start out by looking at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and we're going to go talk about a couple of things, and we're going to come back at the end and talk about it again, okay? So I'm just going to introduce it to you here. And uh, he really doesn't like Second Timothy. His favorite's First Timothy. Don't don't take it to heart. Don't take it hard, guys. Uh, but know this: hard times will come in the last days. Now, this just right there, I think, is such an encouragement to be reminded. When I grew up in, in the church, this was used more of as as like, oh, that that sinful, stupid world out there. They're just a bunch of sinners. Thank God we have it right, though. You know, and it was kind of used more as a way of uh, building up arrogance, Christian arrogance. Uh, but, you know, since I've gotten older, I, I studied it with different eyes. Um, and I pop my, pop my eyeballs out and put new eyeballs in, and I tried it again. And it, uh, it went, it, 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 it's, it's a lot better when you're, an, when you're an adult, you know. Hard times, that, that, that it's going gonna, gonna to come. Okay, so don't, don't be surprised by this. Okay, all right. For people will be lovers of self. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable slanders without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness but denying its power. Avoid these people. I grew up, I, I talk about this all the time. I grew up in the church, and I got very bitter towards Christians because I went to a series of churches. Well, not a series, two churches. Uh, I went to, but I was there for a long time, so I guess it's kind of the same. I went to, the churches that I went to as a kid, they were, they were more like clubs. And there was just this attitude of, you know, like I was talking about the Christian arrogance thing and just kind of thinking that the people in the world, they're just a bunch of idiots, uh, you know, are with their newfangled science, you know, and, and all just kind of th this idea of, of I don't know, the, the, you, you wouldn't think that these people would take a bullet for you. You know what I mean? You wouldn't think that this is like a family. You would think of it more of, oh, this is that club that we go to where we talk about how stupid everybody else is. You know what I mean? If, you, if you've been in that atmosphere, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you haven't, it's hard to explain it. It's like, it's, it's like a club. Like There's no other way to say it. And so then when I, when I got into more like ministry ministry, I, I got in ministry when I was 13. And then, um, but pastoring, I guess, was, was let's see, uh, 22 or 3 or I don't know, somewhere around there. Uh, when I was 22 or 23, I got into pastoring. And uh, I was genuinely surprised by the two faces that you see of some people. Not, not everybody, but there are some people that you love and you serve and you think if you do your job correctly enough, they're just going to change. And they're just, surely somebody wouldn't treat somebody who is nice to them wrong. Well, much to my surprise, yes. And many of these people actually call themselves Christians, which was another thing that surprised me. And I had this grudge against the church, not realizing that my grudge wasn't with the church. It was with some people who called themselves the church. But did you know that those people existed way back in Paul's day too? You know, they were mangas, but they weren't really of us. You know, they talk about this so many different times. Well, now that I've pastored, I kind of get that. I'm putting pieces together. And so now going through this unloving, there's been some times when there, you know, I dealt, I dealt with a problem in a situation, somebody called themselves a Christian. I think, what the heck is going on here? That was completely mean, just mean-hearted. Not like doing something mean on accident, like, sorry. But I mean, just a mean-hearted thing to do. And yes, this is exactly what, what Paul warned us about way back 2,000 years ago. Yes, there are going to people, be people who are unloving. And then he goes on with all these different things without self-control. Without love for what is good. See, I thought that this was talking about people out there in the world. It's talking about people in the church, too. See, that's what that club mentality didn't get. It didn't put the pieces together. Oh, well, those idiots out there, they need to get their act together. 
us idiots in here need to get our act together too. And I didn't, we, that wasn't part of that club, that part of the club. If it was something that we had to change, that wasn't a thing we talked about. But if there's a thing about how everybody else is stupid, that's definitely how we talk. I mean, oh boy, oh boy, you should have seen how in every single sermon there was something about gays. I mean, they just need to straighten up their life and all these different things, right? But then never once was it talked about about the way that Christians are expected to no longer gossip. Well, man, there takes that takes my Saturday after, afternoon out of the way. <laughs> so life has a way of wearing us down and stretching us out. If you've been alive for, I don't know, any number of days, you've probably figured this out yourself. It just wears us down. It stretches us out. If you guys have ever had a treadmill, they, they have those little those little black things that go around the um, the motor part, and it has like this grip on it. Well, if you actually use them, and everybody's thinking, wait, you're supposed to use it? Yes, it's true. If you actually use the treadmill, you eventually wear down that that tread, that 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 black bit. That's why it's called a treadmill. No, I'm just, I'm just joking, guys. Uh, you actually wear down that black bit, and where it rubs on the on the wheel, it, it gets a little bald spot to it, and then eventually it pops if you actually use it enough, and you have to replace the tread. Well, that's kind of what life does to us. And uh, so what? some of us have this idea, well, that's just not fair. That shouldn't happen. I should just keep on going on, on the treadmill of life, and I'm just never going to wear out. Nothing bad's ever going to happen. And if something does happen, we instantly take it to God and say, I have another complaint to file. That's number 72. I don't know if you're counting, but I am. And then we get disappointed with God because he has failed to meet our expectation when the problem was our understanding of the rules. <laughs> We misinterpreted the rules. <laughs> and um, so, you know, in life, we're all looking for a little bit of relief. And, and a lot of people go to different things. Some people go to drugs. Some people go to entertainment. Some people just overwhelm themselves with pleasure. They try and constantly watch TV or, or, or whatever will give them that sense of, of okayness. Things are going to be okay somehow or another. Um, and some people, they, they do relationships. They just go from relationship to relationship, stay in it as long as it's uh, new and exciting, and then as soon as it kind of loses that edge and it's no longer distracting them, well, they just go to another, another relationship. Everybody has something that they're looking for in life to find a little bit of relief. And uh, I think it's something that we all kind of deeply connect with. There, there's a musician, his name's um, Brian Fallon, and uh, he has one of the songs, and that's actually what he's talking about, is how, you know, we're going through and we're just looking for a little bit of something to bring us just a little bit of relief as we go through the different things we go through. And that's exactly what I want to talk about tonight. So everyone has struggles. Everyone. Some people have health struggles, right? Um, not all of us have health struggles. Not, not everybody's going to be, you know, um, having to get colonoscopies every five years. <laughs> that's me, this guy. Uh <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, not everyone's gonna ha gonna deal with maybe betrayal. Maybe that's something that, that you deal with quite a lot. You know, if you're in any kind of ministry, I don't see how you could go along without um, experiencing this. But you know, some people don't don't maybe deal with that too much. Some people are gonna deal more with loss. You see, some people and it's like they have problem after problem after problem. They lose one family member, then another family member. I mean, I think of that story that Chuck told in a couple series ago. Um, maybe it was. I guess it was last year sometime. He was talking about the guy that wrote that hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And he mentioned in his sermon about uh, how, you know, a bunch, let me think if I can remember, um, a, a bunch of his kids died. And then he, when he was on the, on the boat, remember? You remember? Yeah. Like a bunch of his kids die and all this stuff. And, and, and uh, so then he, he, he's like, okay, great. You know, and everything just kind of goes from bad to worse for this poor guy. You know, and then he writes that hymn, It's Well With My Soul. You know, and um, I wish I could remember all the all the bad things that happened, but it's not really a main point for me here. My main point being everybody has that something that, that they have to deal with. Sometimes some people have more health problems than other people, right? And it just seems like they always have something else that's falling apart with their body. It's like, let's start getting duct tape and glue and just start seeing if we can stop this from falling apart. <laughs> um you know, I, 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 Ricky told me once that duct tape can fix everything. So I was trying to fix my colitis with duct tape. It didn't do a single thing. All that it brought was, you know, I went from my colonoscopy and the doctor's like, what is this? <laughs> so, uh, but we carry our struggles 
and not theirs. And that's the first little bit of, little bit of hope that we have. I don't have to carry somebody else's struggle. Sometimes I look at my struggle and I think this is just too much. I wish that that person had to deal with this. Do you ever, do you ever do that? I have this health problem. I wish they had it instead of me. Or I wish that they had it for just a day so they can understand what it's, what it's like going through this. Or sometimes we look at somebody else and just say, I wish, and, and that kind of jealousy kind of comes up. I wish I didn't have problems like them. I remember back when I had sleeping problems, which was from birth until um, 29. <laughs> uh, you know, I used to always look at people who could just fall asleep, and I was like, why couldn't I have that? Why couldn't that? Why couldn't that be me? You know, that jealousy. Yeah, and you look at and you and you and you go with something, go through something every single day. A lot of times, silently, people don't even know about it, and you just think, I wish, I wish that, that we could just switch places, but. The flip side of that, like I said, this is the good part. We don't have to carry their struggles. We just have to carry our own. And uh, thank God for that. We, we think we can make life struggle-free. And I've spent a good deal of my life trying to make it struggle-free. And we think that if we can somehow manage this struggle-free existence, we're going to find happiness. That's what's going to do it. It's going to fix everything. I just have to get rid of all my struggles, and then I'll be happy. So if Chuck didn't have to go to dialysis, if I didn't have to deal with colitis, if Lauren didn't have to deal with her, do all that pain, um, you know, somehow if we could just take that thing that we're going through and just throw it away, our life would be problem-free, we'd be happy. Something I've learned is that the existence or lack of existence of a problem does not bring happiness. If you don't have a problem, you'll get used to it and you'll stop being happy. If you do have a problem, you have to get used to it and learn to be happy anyways. That's something that is hard to deal with because I think, well, no, because I really don't want to have to deal with this, you know. But the truth is that happiness isn't going to come just by me no longer having problems. But struggles come, and sometimes worries of struggles come. If you guys remember Chuck's last series, he actually talked about this. Not just the fear of the storm, but the fear that a storm might come. <laughs> and... Uh, so sometimes struggles come, sometimes just worries of struggles come, or sometimes the struggles of others come. Maybe it's a loved one that's going through something and we can't do a single thing about it. And so we look at it and we're like, ah, we want to do something, but there's nothing you can do. You, you know, um, if you've ever lost someone that was just like really, really close to you, you know that feeling of hopelessness. You can't stop it from happening. You can't just like reach out and like, I will stop you from dying. It just, it's not something you can really do. It's, it's it's out of your control. So even if you were able to get out of this out of this problem unscathed, there will always be other problems. And even if it doesn't happen to you, it'll happen to someone that you love. And supposing that it doesn't, somehow your mind will decide that it is tired of having too much peace, and you'll start having fear that something bad might happen. It's better to just get rid of the idea of utopia waits around the bend and just enjoy where you are in life rather than trying to always find something to, to take it all away. And I want to bring up an interesting question that I myself have struggled with lately. What if we weren't meant to be perfectly satisfied with this life? What if this life wasn't supposed to be perfect or a utopia? What if this life wasn't supposed to be without its own problems? What if we were content and enjoyed life without being in love with it? Is, there, is that okay to not love your life and to still be content but without loving it? Isn't that okay? Somewhere along the line, though, we, we, we've crossed that and we said, no, it, that's not good enough. I have to be in love with my life. And so we here in America, we have problems that people in third world countries wish that they had. Right, like I, I, I get I get diagnosed with colitis, and they're like, okay, here's some medicine, and it starts working, and okay, things are looking good, and so what's the initial reaction that we have? I want to keep praying until I don't have to take medicine anymore, right? That's just something that pops into our head. Do you realize what a blessing it is that I get treatment for something that a hundred year, hundred years ago I wouldn't have? There are places in the world where people have colitis and they receive zero care for it. See what I mean? And so instead of focusing on that blessing, 
well, I don't want to have to take medicine anymore. I don't have to take the colonoscopies. I don't want to have to deal with all the scary things that are happening with my body. I don't, I don't want to have to deal with the pain and the this and that and that. <laughs> well, I hate to tell you, but I bet you most women wouldn't like to have pain when they're pushing out a baby. <laughs> and yet they do. <laughs> There's a lot of things in life that we don't have to necessarily like, but it's a part of life. One day you will die. You can be afraid of it all your life if you want and sit your, spend the rest of your life having panic attacks, but it's not going to change anything about it at all. And uh, so I want to read you a quote, which I bet 90% of you have already heard. If we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy the most probable explanations that we were made for another world. That just makes sense. It makes all kinds of sense. But instead, we say, no, I want to have my cake and eat it too. I want everything in this life to go perfect all the time. And that I will only find relief if I get everything my way. Often we get frustrated that life isn't fair. And then we bring that to God in prayer as though this is our perfect utopia. And we try and take our prayers to such a place where my prayers are centered around me getting everything my way. Instead of, God, thank you for getting me the help that I need for my colitis. Thank you, God. Instead, we do something like this. And this is the depth of arrogance and unthankfulness. Lord, I pray that you'd heal me completely. It's not good enough that you've blessed me uncomparably. It's not good enough. So we get frustrated that life isn't fair, and rather than accepting it and trusting God in the unfairness, we do this. No, I demand that life be fair. And then we take those prayers to God. God, it's not fair that I'm the one who's having this, but my brother is the screw-up. <laughs> Just kidding. You guys have never prayed that? Come on. <laughs> Everybody's looking at me like, his brother is a screw up? No, that's not that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I'm the good one. I'm the I'm the perfect one. They're the mess up. <laughs> Have you never prayed something like that? Where, where, where you take your frustration to God? I'm the one that did the right thing, and I'm the one who's having to suffer for all this. Why don't you inflict your misery on someone else? Like um, you know, I remember one time there was this person who made fun of me in second grade. Inflict them. You, you see what I mean? Where we just kind of we're looking for this perfection out of life, and when we can't find it, we go to we, we take it to God in prayer. And then when God doesn't answer that prayer, then we get disappointed with God because he didn't answer in the way that I wanted him to. And then we get frustrated. And it's frustrating that I have to deal with this. Everybody has to deal with something. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I get where that mentality comes from, and, and in, in my heart of hearts, I really do wish that we could do that. We could just... Name it and claim it and, and proclaim it in prayer and everything would just work how I wanted. Wouldn't that be great? Loans, gone. Uh, well, debt. Debt and loans, gone. Uh, health problems, gone. And bills of any kind, gone. Annoying family members, gone. You know, all this list of things that we're going to throw in the fire. And it's like, well, you know, that's not going to find you really any relief. And in fact, I would highly, highly recommend this first off god doesn't owe his perfection and i would strongly encourage that in prayer you stop going to god making demands and praying according to what's fair let me give you an example since i had this last flare-up i have had crippling anxiety it messed with my blood sugar levels my blood pressure <laughs> crazy high um, my heart rates, I mean, resting RPM was over 110. Resting. <laughs> I was just sitting there with my heart going crazy. It's wrecked havoc on my system. Instead of, instead of praying for something like me to find complete healing from colitis, can you pray for me to, for, can you pray for this for me? Pray for my anxiety. That would help. That, that would help. See, I, I, I've come to accept the fact that I'm not going to have perfect health to the point of my death. One day I will die. That's going to happen. If I get healed from colitis, I'll have something else that goes wrong, and I will eventually die because our bodies are temporary. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's better to just come to grips with this now. 
your body is wasting away. I don't want to be the one to rip off that band-aid, but I guess that's just where we've come to. So instead of hiding from that, trust God in the middle of your unfairness. God, it's not fair that I have to go with this. Yeah, sure. I, you're not going to argue, but you're still going through it. So you might as well try to learn to trust God through it. So why did you let them do that, God? This is examples of, of what, we, what we say in our prayers to God. Why, why did you let them do that? Why did you let that happen? God, make them do this, that you would make them come to repentance by, I don't know, throwing a log in their way or something. You know, we have all these things of how we can be in control of the situation. Or how about this? Lord, have your way. I'm not in control of the situation. And I'm not going to pray for you to be for you to make me in control of the situation. There's people I want to be saved. And God, I'm asking that you would touch them. But understand that God doesn't have a list of some people that he wants in heaven and some people he doesn't want in heaven. That's your list. You want your kids to make it, you but then to hell with everybody else, right? Now I do mean I don't mean that in the derogatory cuss word kind of, I mean that literally to hell with the rest of them off or on their way. But that's not how God works. He doesn't have that list. Everyone didn't isn't on the to hell list. He's, they're on the to heaven list that he wants them to be there. There's not a person that, that he doesn't want to be there. That's your list. So we go, we take that list and we take it to God and we say, God, we want this to happen. Right? I want you to touch to do to do this, but that's not how it works. God, that you would make them come to repentance. I'll only love you if you comply with my with my demands. God oftentimes works in ways that we we don't really like. Like I'll his great example. I mean, I hate to keep beating a dead horse here, but I want to bring up my 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 thing again, again. And everybody's oh yeah again. Uh, I was praying for healing, really really praying. Other people were praying too, and this is the part God did answer. He did speak to me. You want to know what he said? I actually wrote it down because I didn't like it so much. So now I'm going to relay that information that I don't like to all of you. He said this, you're going to have to go to the doctor. You're going to be okay, but you're going to have to go to the doctor. No! So I went to the doctor, and then, okay, this colonoscopy. God, if you could just make it where I don't have to, you're going to have to get the colonoscopy. You're going to be okay, but you're going to have to get it. It's like, no, but I prayed, and I had faith. You're supposed to make it where I don't have to do that. It's my butt. And yet, here we are. God made me go through something that I didn't want to go through. Did you know that God's going to make you go through some things that you don't want to go through? Chuck, did you did you want to be on Dallas's Chuck? Was that like your every night you went to bed, God, please, if I could just have one thing answered, just please, I want dialysis. I need needles in my life. Didn't he tell us like in 15 different sermons how much he hates needles? <laughs> I don't like that. But but here we are. And so God did answer me. He just didn't give me the answer that I didn't like. I mean, sorry, he just didn't give me the answer that I liked. And so here's another thing. I wanted an instantaneous healing now. And this is instead how God answered. He's healing me with doctors and medicine. Man. See, instead of being grateful that I have a good doctor who found the problem and got me the help that I needed, I'm now complaining because he didn't answer in the way that I wanted. Do you see how that just ungratefulness. It, it creeps up so much. And I personally have struggled so much with looking at other people and saying, why can't I be normal like them? If you've gone through a chronic illness that you've had for longer than five years, you know exactly what I'm talking about. In fact, there actually might be people who've had things for under five years, but typically it takes a good deal of time for you to get to that point of complete, utter irritation. <laughs> with some people reach that very fast. For me, it took five years. Um, and then you're like, okay, I've had enough. It was fun. It was fun for a while. Uh, it's like watching the same movie every night. <clears throat> but God, that's not how I wanted it. So instead, I'm having to learn how to rejoice in the midst of this. And that's, that's pretty hard. That's, that's pretty hard. And God got me through. He didn't abandon me. I had to go through my own little storm, but he got me through. And that seemed unfair to me, and God had his own little way of showing me that life isn't about fairness. Okay, all right, I guess that makes sense. And then uh, this uh, thought entered into my brain, and I, once again, I don't know where it came from, but does it matter if I go to the grave in perfect health? A lot of times, we as Christians want God to heal us just so that we aren't inconvenienced. 
It has nothing to do about God's glory. And the thing is, this is very easy to do when you have a chronic illness because you just get tired of dealing with it. It's an inconvenience. It's a pain in the butt, literally for some people. Um, and, you know, it's just something that you have to deal with all the time. And it's, it's not one of those things you get to turn off and turn on, right? And then it causes all these other symptoms, and you're just tired of dealing with symptoms. You're tired of medicine and doctors and appointments and all these different things. You just want it to go away. Well, that has nothing to do with the glory of God. See, some people in parts of the world are being are, are suffering for Christ. They're, maybe they're getting their houses burned or losing their belongings. Maybe they're seeing their loved ones killed. Maybe they're dying. Meanwhile, in, in here in the good old U.S. of A., we, the, the thing, that our test, our trial, is having to put up with getting the help that we need. Doesn't seem as bad, does it? Sometimes I really get in this rut of, oh, woe is me, but then I remember how other people in harder places of the world have it, and it's a little bit easier to... So we have this blinder that we wear of what's fair, and it, and it keeps us from really doing what God called us to and from making our life count. Because we are on this endless, endless search for what can be fair. John 12, 25 says, The one who loves his life will lose it. I'm, I didn't do that, I swear. The one who loves his life will lose it, and the one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. He's not talking about loving and hating in the sense of like, you have to wake up and say, ah, oh, he knew. He doesn't always talk about. It. He's talking about when you hold on to your life, when you when you when your whole pursuit is just my precious. You know, it's not about anybody else. It's about watching out for yourself all the time. You're you're in love with your life. It's okay to be content in life. It's okay to even enjoy your life. That's fine. Don't love it. Don't don't choose it over God. And hating in this context is more of casting it off for God's kingdom. It's more one of preference. If you sow to this world, you will find yourself in need. If you sow seed to this world, you will find yourself in need. One day you will wake up and you will need something that only God can bring. Let's say, for instance, you make your whole life the pursuit of wealth. Eventually that wealth won't be enough and you'll find yourself in drastic need. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. This life is definitely better with God, but the next life is abundant. It's far beyond what you could ever hope. And that, 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 that thing that you're looking for in this life, its reality is the next life. See, we're in this quest in life to find this happiness that's only going to ever exist in the next one. God, it's not fair that I have to deal with this. I'm tired of dealing with depression and anxiety. I'm, I'm tired of dealing with, in the next life, you won't. But ha but going through this life thinking that you can get to a place of having a perfect utopia, it's just wrong. You're either going to have health problems or you're going to have mental problems. Or you're going to have emotional problems. Or you're going to have people problems. Maybe you're going to have ministry problems. Maybe you're going to have a couple different ones all rolled together in a nice little cocktail. You know, whatever, you're not going to have a carefree existence. It's not going to happen. But the good news is that we're almost home. Almost. Just a little bit longer. So there are three things, and we're going to look at tonight. So we're going to look at one, next week the second one, the week after that the third one. So there are three areas that we seek relief in life. And the first area is people. And it's not necessarily bad to try and find relief from peop in people, not from people, but in people. Th that's not necessarily a problem. In fact, I've actually heard a lot of people who go around from church to church causing problems, and they tell people, you know, you shouldn't be dependent on other people, and, you know, it's, it's up to you and only you to grow and all this stuff. And I, I kind of agree with what they're saying, but not really what they were saying. What they were saying is that we don't need each other, and that's completely false. The reason why they didn't think that we needed, people, needed each other, because they made a habit of going from church, getting offended, going to another church. That's their lifestyle. The, the Bible makes it absolutely clear we do need each other. <laughs> There, there's no way in life that you're going to make it through all by yourself. Solo y mio. It's not going to happen. It's, no, it's not. So this, number one, isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just begs for context. So we, we look for the perfect spouse, the perfect friend, the perfect family. Some of us even live for family. It's, it's, it's like everything that's most important in the whole world is our family. You know, even to the point where I would choose them over God. You know what I mean? 
And uh, that's actually something that I've had to do in ministry is come to the point of choosing family or choosing God. It's very, very difficult, especially because it's quickly become something that's not just your struggle. All of a sudden, all these other people you don't even know are involved in it. And, you know, the church all takes sides and everybody else takes sides. And then the friends that you used to share now have to pick between. And it just gets difficult and complicated and it's just hard to manage. And um, I guess what I'm getting at here is, is we all have to come to that point of living for people, finding relief in people, or finding relief in God and people. From now on, five in one household will be divided. Three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. This is something that surprised me when I actually went through it, even though Jesus warned us 2,000 years ago. It just still caught me off guard when it actually happened. I, I, don't, I don't understand how we can have a book that literally talks about everything we're ever going to go through, and either we just don't read it or don't, we don't remember it. And then all of a sudden, we're reading it and we're going through something. And something just pops out of it. Oh, oh, it talks about that. Huh, who knew? So we take it personally when people, in our even family members, betray us and leave the faith and all this different stuff. And we take it personally. Well, first off, it's not really about you and them. It's more about them and God. Second off, Jesus did warn us. So that takes us to two things I want to I want to bring up here about people. The first thing is that people are a temporary commodity. People are a temporary commodity. You can have friends, you can have family, just understand every single one of them is a temporary commodity. Either eventually either you or your spouse is going to die and there's a good chance that whichever one is left is going to be left on their own for a while. Maybe not too long, but still Chances are you aren't going to die at the exact same time. Some of us outlive our children, much to the most painful of realities. And that's just, once again, something that, that kind of happens. No matter how you look at it, people are a temporary commodity. One of you is going to die or one of you is going to leave. Maybe, maybe for instance, I have this best friend, right? And he's going to move over to Florida or something. And I'm not going to see him again for 20 years. No matter how you look at it, people are a temporary commodity. Matthew 6.27 says, Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? Can, can any of you change what's happening? Can any of you make it where by worrying about what could happen or what is about to happen or anything like that, you're, you're going to change it, what's happening? So instead, appreciate now and don't worry about then. Eventually, you're going to have to face death. Don't be afraid of it. When you're there, God will get you through it. Eventually, you're going to have to deal with the loss in your, in your life. Don't worry about it. Eventually, you'll get there, and God will get you through when you get there. You're not going to think that you can, but somehow you will. Eventually, you're going to have to deal with things like war, things that, things that, you don't, that are uncomfortable, that you don't want to deal with, but you're still going to have to deal with it. But the thing is, appreciate now. Wherever you are, appreciate now. And God will get you through it when you get there. So then, if people are a temporary commodity, people are also a necessary commodity. You can't live your life guarded. Not, not, not really. Because if you live your life on guard all the time, you stop really living. You, you don't want to be hurt so much that you stop embracing people and you stop actually experiencing. Not only that, but they've done numerous studies that shows that when you have a community, when you're connected with people, you live longer, you tend to be healthier and have, le have less health problems. We as people were definitely made not to be solo, but to be a group, to be with someone. And I'm not just talking about marriage. So people are a temporary commodity, but people are a necessary commodity. You can't run from the pain that you will eventually feel. Romans 12, 4 through 5 says, Now as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We are one. We need each other. So for every love, there is a promise, a promise of loss. There is nobody in your life right now that is a, is a constant. That's God. God is the constant. Everybody else is a temporary commodity. I'm not saying, once again, you should not have friends. I'll talk about that in just a second. Because they are a, people are a necessary commodity in your life. You need friends. You need people in your life. Okay? The, the, the thing is, though, we don't need to put them as above God. 
and to make it where our whole existence is about that. There's a movie called How to Train Your Dragon. Um, they made three of them, and then they made a show. But this quote is from the third movie, and it's the father. His name is Stork the Vast. And one of the things that he says in the movie is, with love comes loss. It's just part of the deal. Sometimes it hurts, but in the end, it's all worth it. It's all worth it. Sometimes we go through life and try to live so guarded so we don't have to feel pain. You're going to feel pain no matter what you do. People are a necessary commodity. You need others in your life. There's no greater gift than love. And another way that I've heard it said is to, to, it's better to love and lose than to not have loved at all. And some people who are hurting will say, well, you've never lost. And it's like, yeah, I have. <laughs> and let me tell you, I mean, for instance, I, I have six kids. One of them died. And I had to get five. I had to lose one to get to get five. You kind of get what I'm saying here? And so whereas it's not a game of math, Pastor talked about that two, three weeks ago, and I very much appreciated that because that's actually what I've heard some people say. Hey, at least you have five left. In fact, one time I was just to pieces about this. It was right after it happened, and uh, I was talking to a pastor friend up in Albuquerque, and that's basically the constant, the what he said. He had he has like six kids, and he's like, "Well, I mean, you still have five. I was like, "You've never lost one, have you?" He's all no, and I was like, "Ah, oh, I chose." <laughs> and uh, but. I had to lose one to get five. And as much as, as I was painful to lose one, if that was the only way I could get my other kids, I, I think I would have gone through it again. Because I really love them. See what I mean? Like, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, yeah, pain, but you can't run from pain. You can't have an existence that's free of pain. And not only that, but this pain that I feel, it, it's mine. It's my story. I, I don't regret. It's my pain. And it's something that has founded what God has brought me through to this day. It's part of my story. So love isn't safe, but without love, life is a lot less. Don't ever expect to get much out of life without love. Pain is guaranteed whether you love or not. But hate and apathy are guaranteed to be a harmful waste. If you want your life to be a harmful waste, spend it in hate and apathy. If you hurt, it's because you felt something. Sometimes you lose someone and it really, really hurts. Well, that just means that what you had was real. And uh, memories, can, memories can definitely hurt. But they're from a life lived. Sometimes it pains us to have a certain memory. We remember someone or something that was very dear. And uh, sometimes a smell will bring them back. But the thing is, although that memory does hurt, it's a bittersweet hurt. Because with that pain of loss is also the memory of life. And it's a life that you lived. So now let's talk about 2 Timothy chapter 3. But know this, hard times, they're going to come. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness but denying its power. I mean, they look good. They act the part. So how does this apply to us? Well, first off, as for you, don't do this. <laughs> if he's saying that these are what, this is what those th what people are doing, don't do it yourself. I think that's the first thing we can learn from this. Um, as for you, <laughs> don't be a lover of yourself. <laughs> don't be a lover of money. Don't be boastful. Don't be proud or demeaning or disobedient to your parents. Don't be uh, ungrateful or unholy. Don't be unloving, irreconcilable. Be reconcilable. Don't go around causing problems and you just have your nose in your head. No, I don't, you can't tell me what to do. Be reconcilable. Don't, don't be a slander. Don't just go around talking about people. Don't be without self-control. Have self-control. Don't be brutal without love for what is good. Don't be a traitor. Don't be reckless. Don't do those things. That's the first thing. The second thing, don't associate with these kinds of people because bad company does corrupt good morals.
And, uh, man, I still remember the day where this verse just clicked in my head. I was reading it, and uh, there was something that was going on. I was like, man, and then just, you know, where, where you read a verse, and it's like, ah, ah. And where it said about people being lovers of self. And I was like, oh, 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 oh yeah, ah, I get it. I get it. So then we get down to uh, verses 10 and 12 through 13, I hope. Oh, I didn't include them. Well, that's not great. Can I, uh, I'm going to borrow, yeah, if you could. If you could turn it to the scripture, too, because I don't know how to do that. Sorry, I might. Thanks. Smartphones are of the devil. Not carrying your Bible, carrying this things so you can be texting on Facebook. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. Seriously, I'm just joking. Um, so, Second Timothy, uh, chapter three, verse ten says, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my whole purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. And then down in verses 12 through 13, it says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Live this way. We'll go back to 10 just in case you missed it. You, however, have followed my teaching. So that's the first thing, his teaching, his conduct, how he's living his life, his aim in life, his main purpose, his drive. Do you have that drive in life that Paul had? Do you know where you're going and are you taking the steps to get there? His aim in life, his faith, trusting in God through all the different things he went through, his patience, dealing with people patiently. I know I don't have that. His love, his steadfastness, not going the other way, holding the line. I think soldiers maybe understand that phrase a little bit more than your typical people. Hold the line. So we can either work for self and comfort, or we can work for the kingdom. That's what it really comes down to. When we're finding relief in life, we can work for ourselves. It's all about me. We can work for our comfort, what will make us happier now, or we can work for the kingdom. And we might say, oh, but it's unfair. But that unfairness is an opportunity. I know many grandparents who still to this day complain that they have to raise their grandkids because it's unfair. I hear this all the time. A lot of people in Tularosa are grandparents are raising their grandkids. Here's the thing. It's an opportunity. I know it's one that is a little bit time-consuming that you did, hoped you wouldn't have to do. You, you're tired of your kids, maybe your responsibility. I understand all those things. However. It's still an opportunity. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. We, we in life, we go to these things and we see it's unfair, but it's also an opportunity. Having colitis is not fair, but it's an opportunity. The, the trick is an opportunity for what? You just have to find what your greatest inconvenience, what opportunity it brings. So how do we apply this to our life? Well, there is no way. That's it. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> surprise. Uh, first off, be thankful for who you have now instead of complaining about who you lost. This person betrayed me. This person died. Shame on them. You know, th this person, you know, let me down. This person, instead of complaining about the people that you lost, be thankful for who you have. That changes your whole perspective. The fact all friendships eventually end, all relationships on this earth eventually end, make them more special, not less. It means you had this much time, and they had this much time, and you both chose to spend it together. That's not something that's less. That's something that, that's more. And I'll tell you something more. Even if somebody ends up betraying you in the end, that doesn't mean that the entire friendship was out the window. You still had some good times too. It might have ended poorly. Just don't think about that as much. Maybe think about the good that came from it. You know, well, that's easier said than done. I've done it. <laughs> okay, I'm not talking about something I haven't done. Um, don't, don't live with regret in your life. Of First off, memories. 
I shouldn't have loved them. I wish I could forget. Or maybe regret of your past. Well, look at what I've done. And I just regret that. Look at the years that I've wasted. Or maybe living with the regret of your present. Living isolated. I wish I wasn't so isolated. What you're doing now. So get out. Don't, don't live in that regret. Instead of looking back at the mistakes you've made, or maybe they weren't even mistakes, just the bad things, relationships you've had in the past or you have now, do something about it. Maybe you love someone and they broke your heart. There's people more. And I'm not saying it, you, the hurt will just magically disappear. I'm saying don't block yourself off from the world. Do you feel isolated and lonely? Chances are it's because you're isolated and lonely. Studies show that when you feel isolated and lonely, it's because you've isolated yourself and are therefore lonely. Are you getting what I'm saying? Maybe you should leave the couch. Ta try talking to people just a little bit. A little bit. Um, growing up, I, I was I actually didn't have many people to, to talk to at all. Um, I've spent a lot of my time playing, you know, outside. Um, but part of that was because the churches that I went to, they weren't really people that you would call friends that you actually wanted to hang around with. So now I'm stuck with this awkward dilemma for the first time in my life of no longer having having excuses for not having friends in church. So, yeah, now I have to talk to people and be unlonely and. We all have our burdens to bear. So build relationships. You cannot do life alone. Build bridges with people. Bring them to God. And here's the thing. Bring yourself to God too. Sometimes we, we get lost in the ministry aspect of life. Oh, I'm, help, I'm trying to bring people to God. In that process, bring yourself to God because, I mean, you do need it every day. Don't ever get to the place of saying, well, they need it. So I'm living my life to try and get these people into church. When you still need, you still need it. <laughs> God is always with you even through death, and he is always very close even if you don't feel it. And here's the unfortunate reality of life. Tragedy is when you learn best that God is always with you. If there was never a tragedy, I fear in my heart of hearts that we would never know how much God is actually there. What if our greatest disappointments are a reminder of things that this life just can't satisfy? Isaiah 43 says this. Now, this is what the Lord says. I've quoted this about 500 times over the past couple months because it's one of the verses that really stuck out to me, with me throughout this whole um, thing that I've gone through. Now, this is what the Lord says, the one who created you, Jacob, and the one who formed you, Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you, and the rivers will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, and the flame will not burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, and your Savior. There's a lot going on there, and I highly recommend you memorizing this and just spending time each day just thinking about the verse, because you kind of need to let it soak in a little bit. But there's something that I want you to get here, and that's I'm going to break this verse apart so you really get it. This is what the Lord says. The one who created you, Jacob, and the one who formed you. Okay, so don't really focus too much on the Jacob and Israel part and try and find the main idea of this. The Lord says you're mine. That If you take the verse and you summarize it to its most basic elements, that's what you get. Okay? And that's what I've done for you here. Okay? This is what the Lord says, you are mine. We have who's talking and the main idea of what he's saying. But then he has this little phrase in, in between, do not fear. Okay, so we have a little, I'll go back to the main thing. So he says, this is what the Lord says, the one who created you, Jacob, the one who formed you, Israel. Do not, think of those as parenthetical um, statements. So th think of them as things that are off to the side. Okay, push them over to your side in your mind. The, the one who created you, Jacob, and the one who formed you. Just move that over to the side. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name, you are mine. So this is what the Lord says, you are mine. What's, what's, what does that matter? Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. 
So, okay, the Lord says, don't be afraid, you are mine. Well, why shouldn't I be afraid? Because of four different statements. We're going to break them up. He, he, the prophet breaks, breaks them up into a series of two. Two before, two after. Two that deal with before you were ever born, which is a really big encouragement. Before you were ever born, God was still in control. Think about that, okay? And then the two other things are after you were born, things that he brought salvation through. And the idea is that you as, as a whole person in your entirety, from your beginning to your very end, you do not have to be afraid because you, you, you are his. He has claimed you, okay? This is what the Lord says, the one who created you, the one who formed you. So you can put your name in. It doesn't have to be Jacob Israel. You can put your name, the Ricky. This is what the Lord says, the one who created you, Ricky, the one who formed you, Ricky. Do not fear. Why shouldn't I fear? I have redeemed you, and I have called you, and you are mine. The main idea here is we shouldn't be afraid because God, because we are his. That means that he's with us through it. He's not abandoned us. If we, if we go through it, 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 he hasn't abandoned us through it. He's in control, and he's guiding us. Think about this. God himself says, hey, you don't have to be afraid. You're mine. Let me give you two little evidences. I created you. I formed you. And I redeemed you, and then I called you by your name. Now you can put this all back together and get the whole verse and see just the import of this. Now this is what the Lord says, the one who created you, Jacob, the one who formed you, Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You're mine. I'm in control. I got this covered. You don't have to be afraid. Well, what about the bad things and all this? When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. I will be with you. And the rivers, they're not going to overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched and the flame will not burn you. You're going to get through. It's going to be okay. And I'll tell you something else. This promise extends all the way to death, which means that even when you are dying, you are taking your last breath. You still don't have to be afraid because God will be with you and he will walk you the whole way. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, and your Savior. You will be scared and you will struggle in life, but seek him and lean into others. Think about this, guys. God knew you would be here today. God knew exactly what this point would bring. He created you. He formed you. He called you by name. You are his. He's in complete control. He knew exactly where you'd be today. And so I guess there's just, I guess in summary, well, I wrote a note here. I'm going to read it. Bad things happen. Life is not safe. Not everything that happens is going to, is going to always feel good. But he is still in control and we are his, whatever happens. Now, the, so the main thing that I could summarize with tonight is seek him and lean into others. Do you need people? Yes. Do you need God? Yes. So I also would like to end with um, a little, uh, little exercise that you can do. Um, don't worry, I'm not talking about losing weight. I'm talking about an exercise that can help you. This is called meditation. Um, I do it, and it helps me, so I thought maybe it would help you. Uh, when you feel overwhelmed, when you feel like you can't think, you can't process the information, what you do is you lay down and maybe get some soft music going. Um, you can... Uh, play like an audio bible or something where preferably if it'll play if it'll play something like um maybe a verse like over and over again or if it can play something where you choose not just a random verse but whichever fits your boat i guess um and then what you do is you, you lay down and you think about the verse and, and you take your two hands you put them one over your chest and one over your 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 your, your belly here and you just take really slow but deep breaths. This is actually proven to help you lower your stress levels. Um, and you just breathe in really, really slow through the nose. Uh, try and make it where you don't lift your chest. You only lift your belly in the breath. And then you blow out with your mouth. And you just do this. Focus on counting at first and just have the soft music going with the scripture. And then 
start trying to just think about the scripture. You switch over from the numbers, just counting to the scripture. And what this does is it really calms down your, your mind and helps you to focus and tune in. A lot of times people have a hard time when they just try to pray. They don't really feel like they're able to really get it. Well, meditation is a way of just letting something specifically enter your mind specifically. So like maybe a verse, this is why I say a verse that you can pick, um, a, a verse that maybe directly talks about the thing that you're going through and where it can just kind of repeat itself, and you can just think about the words. And then it also kills two birds with one stone because you can start memorizing the verse really, really easy when it goes a couple different times. And things will start meaning something a little bit different to you. Um, like, for instance, um, the, 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 for the psalm that everybody talks about um, when there's a death, you know, um, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, that verse starts, I mean, that, that chapter says at the very beginning, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. Do you know what that means? He is my guide. He's leading me through this life. Just thinking about that one phrase and just sitting there and, and, and realizing that in your situation, God is still your shepherd. See what I mean? And meditation is that. You're just taking something that the Bible says and you're just thinking about it. That's meditation. You're thinking about it. You're closing off the rest of the world and it will really help your stress levels. It'll help you really learn something. And uh, it might even help you with your prayer. I know it does me. So I know that was a little bit long but I wanted to just kind of hopefully help you guys with some of the things you might be going through. Um, okay, well, Lord, thank you for everything you've done uh, through this week and, and, and in us and everything. Lord, thank you for the good days um, and uh, help us to help us to stay uh, stay thankful uh, during the different things that we go through and to remember that you're always with us and uh, to remember, God, that it's not, it's not a, a waste of time to seek after you. Rather, it's, it's life and health, and peace, and joy. And uh, so, God, I pray that as we go through our different struggles, we'd, we'd remember to, to really seek after you through the heartbreak and through the struggles and through the different things and the disappointments and, uh, and really find that peace. And God, I pray for those who are struggling now that, that, you, would, that you would use these situations as a way to, to deepen their faith um, and their, their, their trust in you, that they would find a level of of relationship with you, Lord, that, that, that eluded them before. And uh, God, we just, we just thank you, and I pray that you'd be with us throughout the week, Lord. Amen.